festive season. It's December today, right? So we can start wishing each other a happy Christmas. Now, you know, I looked at the agenda, and I've only got 15 minutes to speak. So I thought, well, 15 minutes, I don't think I'll do a PowerPoint presentation. Let me just have a conversation with the audience and uh, tell you what's, uh, what, how we plan and how we put our priorities for child health in South Africa. So um, I went through the agenda like uh, a good speaker should do before they come to a conference. And um, I thought the theme for this uh, conference is actually very apt, survive, thrive, and transform. So looking back by way of background uh, and a bit of history, which a lot has been covered by UNICEF, is that uh, on the 1st of January 2016, that's uh, led by the UN, the 17 SDGs for Sustainable Development officially came into force and we moved away from the MDGs. All along, the pressure was on last up to until December 2015 about the countdown to the MDGs. And now we have to shift gear and we're talking about the SDGs. So over the next 15 years, the SDG goals, which uh, UNICEF uh, showed to all of us, will guide all countries on how to end poverty, end hunger, uh, address climate change, and attainment of universal health coverage, just to name a few of those 17 goals that were put up. And then zoning in into South Africa, what guidance do we use? So we use the National Development Plan, which is better known as the NDP, or Vision 2030, and uh, we are pleased to see that it's actually very closely aligned to the SDGs. And the National Development Plan, Vision 2030, gives us a vision of what kind of count country we want South Africa to be in 2030. So a child who's born today in 2016 and when they're about 14, 15 in 2030, what kind of country do we want them to be living in? And one of its objectives one of the objectives of the NDP is to have a generation of people who are under 20 who are HIV free. That's one of the tallest uh, object, uh, orders that uh, we have to um, um, uh, look to. And then another um, uh, objective which is closer to us here is that we need to reduce our maternal, infant, and child mortality. Now what we do at the National Department of Health, we take these plans, and then as part of the plan planning cycle, we put it into what we call the medium term strategic framework. So when we do planning, we plan for three year cycles. And in the medium term strategic framework, we, we, we choose the indicators that we are going to monitor, and against those indicators and targets, budget is committed. So when you see something in the medium term strategic framework already, there's money allocated to that activity. So you cannot come back and say we couldn't do it because we didn't get the funding. The funding has already been committed. So every three years and in the outer year, you get an overlap so that these cycles uh, run over three years and overlap so that you don't, it's, it's always continuous. You don't get a break in your planning. So there's been a great talk about the global strategy for women's, children's, and adolescents' health 2015 to 2030. And this is built on the SDGs. And the pillars for this uh, strategy are the, the theme, which is the survive, thrive, and transform. And we've already been told that to survive is about ending all preventable deaths. Thrive is uh, about ensuring health and well-being. And transform is about creating an enabling environment. So I'm sure all of you know or have seen our South African maternal and child health strategy which was launched in 2012. And it was a five-year strategy. So it's come to the end of its life span this year in 2016. So work has begun on drafting the next five-year plan, which covers the financial years 2017-18 to 2021-22. So this will be our roadmap for child health for the next five years. And this plan, our South African plan, is informed by these global strategies that I've already talked about, as well as our national development plan. So as a country, we've decided to adopt the pillars of survive, thrive, and transform, 
but we've customized them for the South African context because the bigger document is for the whole world, but we've taken that and then distilled it to suit South Africa. The other big policy that we've worked on is the adolescent and youth health policy. So as many of you know, we actually have an old policy. I don't even remember when it uh, came to an end. So we've been very, very actively working on a new one. We're just left with the costing because any policy you do and you put out there, you've got to cost it. Otherwise, how will you implement it if you don't know how, it will, how much it will cost? And then you've also got to indicate the source of funding. So there's the money from the uh, national fiscus, but we also work with a lot of partners and we want to see how much they'll also add onto this policy. So we've actually commissioned a consultant to work on the costing and uh, they're almost done. So this policy is going to be launched pretty soon. I would actually like to spend uh, a bit of time on adolescence because for the first time, strategies and policies are highlighting them as a very special group. If I quote what the UN Secretary General has said, he said, young people are the world's greatest untapped resource, end of quote. And then I went and I looked at the Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing. And the Lancet Commission says they are the largest generation in human history. So we cannot talk health care, health plans, our projections, if we don't make special provision for adolescents. So I hope everybody knows that an adolescent is any human being, male or female, between 10 and 19 years old, right? Okay. And so in South Africa, just like in many parts of the world, they form 18% of our total population. So stats say tells us there are 40, 54 million people in South Africa, and 18% of those are actually uh, people aged uh, under between 15 and 24. So they're a very big group. So the Lancet report has actually come up with some key recommendations. And the first one is that we should reframe adolescent health and design it based on their health needs. Because right now, whenever we talk about youth health and adolescent health, we just talk about two things. We talk about sexual and reproductive health and HIV, and we think, you know, we're done. But what about nutrition? You know, we have a big obesity problem in South Africa, and a lot of these young people are obese. I mean, some are malnourished, but I think more are obese. What about mental health for adolescents? Violence and injury is a very big area, and chronic illness. As I watched uh, the interview of the little girl with the cardiopulmonary illness, I mean, she, she, she's a young uh, person, and we, 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 you know, with a chronic, we had a chronic illness, but in our policies, we say very little about helping uh, young people like that. The second recommendation from the Lancet Commission is that there should be universal health coverage for adolescent health. Right now, we're hardly reaching uh, and uh, meeting their health needs. And the third recommendation is that there should be intersectoral action. And the Lancet is of the view that investing in secondary education for young people is one of the best investments we can make in adolescent health. An educated young person is a very resourceful person. And then the last recommendation they talk about is youth engagement and empowerment, and then that as the uh, health system, we need to grow our own knowledge and capacity. And uh, to that end, um, as the Department of Health, we are advocate, advocating that pre-service curricula for, L, for all healthcare providers, be it nurses, doctors, clinical associates, nutritionists, or psychologists, you must have modules on adolescent health so that you are actually prepared in your working life to deal with this demographic dividend. One of the biggest barriers, the complaints we have, is healthcare workers. They are so judgy. They don't, they don't and that keeps young people away from our health facilities. So that kind of uh, barrier, we really need to work on it and remove it. And then the other problem is that our m and &E systems don't have age disaggregated data. So my unit and I, we really pushed. You know when you worked with, with health information people, I don't know if you've worked with that unit, you really have to be, you have to have a thick skin and be very patient. So our patience paid off. So I'm pleased to share with everybody here that the next national indicator data set will now have an age disaggregate, will have uh, an indicator 
on age disaggregated da data for the PHC headcount. So we'll know uh, which facilities are actually um, attractive to young people and young people come to that facility. We are also going to break down the data for teenage pregnancy so we'll know the age groups of uh, teenagers who are actually getting pregnant. Because right now we just know that um, uh, in our facilities the indicator is that it's uh, deliveries to girls who are under 18 years of age. And it hovers for the past couple of years 70,000, 72,000, which is very high. So now we'll break it down. We'll know exactly how old these girls are. And then we're also going to have disaggregated indicators for contraception. So we'll know what ages uh, uh, girls are when they get their contraception. And then we'll also have age disaggregated data for the termination of pregnancy. So we'll also know. So I think that's uh, uh, something we've managed to, 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 to um, move forward and to help with our planning. Then on another note, on the 27th of November, not too far away well, ago, was World Prematurity Day, and the minister led an event at a clinic in Tswane district, which was focusing on prema prematurity, naturally, and uh, the promotion of breastfeeding. But at this uh, event, uh, the digital um, format of the Road to Health booklet was also launched. So now you can download the Road to Health booklet and you can register a child and then you get reminders on when you're supposed to take your baby for weight checks, uh, when the child's supposed to get the immunization, when the child should get their vitamin A, deworming and so on. So we're really trying to also be, um, uh, 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 you know, being digital and moving forward with technology. But at this event, Minister also announced that antenatal visits will also go up from the current four to eight prenatal visits now. But interestingly enough, the last four will happen in the last trimester because that's when things tend to go wrong. Okay, so we're working on the tools, we're working on uh, the training. So this is something that we really have to implement quite fast. Then. The first 1,000 days, see, I got my pin here, uh, is very important. But others would argue that the uh, first 1,000 days is actually too late. What about pre-1,000 days? Okay? And the pre-1,000 days is how someone prepares for pregnancy, but also access to family planning. Because we all know that the first intervention in reducing neonatal mortality is access to uh, family planning. The pregnancy must be wanted. So I would really like us to not just start bang first 1,000, but let's just look at the time period just before the first 1,000 days. So ladies and gentlemen, the current under five mortality rate is now 38 uh, per thousand, and the SDG target is 25 per thousand. So I don't have to draw a graph to show you what sort of steep we need to take. And then, uh, sadly to say, South Africa still has a significant number of child deaths that are associated with HIV. And we also know that we still have children who die from malnutrition. So I'm pretty sure that many children with malnutrition actually have, un have underlying HIV and or TB. But whatever the cause of that malnutrition is, it's of uttermost importance that each health facility has enough feeding supplements. This is such a simple intervention and it really baffles me why we just can't get it right. Just have, I mean they're not the most expensive thing that we buy in our district but somehow they are the least prioritized. Budget allocations have to be made to make sure that we have no stock outs. Their distribution must not be a preserve of the nutritionists but all health professionals who need to issue them to patients must be able to get the supplements and give them out to those children. There's no point in, in hoarding them. What are you going to do with them? You know? So the district health plans must clearly stipulate that feeding supplements will be available. And you know, we actually wrote to your head of departments. We, we did the um, calculations for you. We told you how many you need and what is the budget allocation. But it seems we're still not getting over that. So please, my appeal, if if anything you take back, let's do that in your, uh, where you're working. Now, with regards to um, HIV, okay, we're going to have a whole session on uh, elimination, but uh, we st like I said, we still have children with HIV. So 
we, the 90, 90, 90 targets and the ensuing cascade, cascade form part of the whole approach. But in order to, 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 to implement these 90, 90, 90 targets, we must find the children. I think that's the most important aspect of this 90, 90 thing. You must find them, all right? Otherwise, you know, it remains a pipe dream. So we need to be very innovative. Like, for instance, let's go to the parent support groups and ask them about their children because that's where we'll find the children. Let's follow the orphans and vulnerable children. That's where we'll find the children. So I'd really like people to come up with ideas and ways of actually getting this 90, 90, 90 working for children, okay? And then immunization is the other very big program that I run. And the aim is that we have to keep coverage above 90% for us to get the benefits of immunization. And then one area that's not given enough attention is polio eradication. That's one of the big global strategies that's out there, is that we need to eradicate polio the same way we eradicated smallpox. Polio is the next one. And uh, the surveillance system that we run is the acute, acute flaccid paralysis surveillance. And I think all of you know the kind of problems we have with this surveillance. There are some districts that are silent. They are not reporting at all. And this is a great, of great concern because it puts South Africa at great risk of missing any polio case, whether it's imported or otherwise, and then suddenly you can imagine such something like that were to happen. So I'd really like to remind everyone on the importance of this indicator and just to help you remember we're actually going to take the HP, H, AFP indicator, acute facet paralysis, and it's going to be added to the dashboard reports that we send out to you. So no one can tell me that they didn't know that this is something we need to look at. We're also extremely concerned about the high TB burden and the comorbidity with HIV, and uh, I'm actually very happy, and congratulations to the organizers, because I see that you've given TB a, a lot of attention, and it's got a, a big... Um, it's got a big uh, time slot on the program because TB is really giving us a lot of problems. And if you look at the stats SA data, it's now the number one killer of adults and children in South Africa. So we really need to put all our efforts there. So when you think about SWOT analysis and look at the O, which is the opportunities, I said I should say something about NHI because that's very topical, right? National Health Insurance and that uh, primary healthcare engineering is the core of NHI. It's got four streams, the school health services, the community health workers, district clinical specialist streams, and general and GP contracting, getting GPs out at primary healthcare. So colleagues, I have uh, three take home messages. One, I would like all of us in our workplace, make places to make it a habit to interrogate the data. You know, we go out of way to get these indicators and get the DHIS to report, but you have to be very granular and go right down to the district and facility level. Don't wait for us at the national level to pick up your outliers and then start phoning you and asking you have, what's happening here, why is this performance like this, and suddenly, oh, is that it? You know, please, we don't like that. And then please, please, please may utilize the quarterly dashboard reports that we meticulously prepare and judiciously send out to you every single quarter. I'm sure everyone here has seen the dashboards, color-coded. So um, in conclusion, I just urge everyone to download, please, all these documents. They're all online, and just, just familiarize yourself with them. And then uh, the last appeal is that um, we are finalizing the country's M, N, C, A, W, H, and N. I hope you all know what that is maternal, newborn, child, adolescent, uh, women's health and nutrition, okay? And this is your last chance to make your input. It's out there. We want to hear what you want to add. And then uh, as a collective, you can tell, we can tell ourselves that we were part of SA's journey to achieving the SDGs. I thank you. Okay, thanks, Namshinansha. You had a tough job in 15 minutes to give us all the good news and the excitement you had to uh, enthuse us with. I allowed you a little bit of leeway, but that's because I think we needed to know a lot of the, the progress and the plans of the National Department of Health. So uh, thank you for exciting us with some of the new developments. Um,